right, so we've talked about executive and legislative branches, so now we're going to jump over to the judiciary and then other sort of important or interesting um, parts of government within the six countries that we're going to talk about. So uh, the judicial branch are institutions within the countries um, that are set aside to interpret the application of laws and policies, settle public disputes, and enforce criminal law. So um, within the United States, we can sort of contextualize what that looks like. Um, as the Supreme Court is the, the highest court in the land. And then we have a system of federal and state um, courts that exist uh, underneath the Supreme Court. Some of them civil courts, um, some of them criminal courts, but all of them sort of within the same, or within, within different systems um, within the judiciary that do these things. So if ideally functioning, um, in most structures of government, but not all, the judiciary will play a large role in maintaining the rule of law. So we have an interesting selection of judiciaries in this, this selection of countries, and we actually do not spend as much time thinking about judiciaries as you would think, um, just for, for some interesting reasons. Th part of the reason is because we have three countries that are authoritarian regimes, and where the ju judiciary doesn't actually play a really large role in sort of checking the power that the other branches are um, are wielding. Um, and, and sort of similarly, because we have Nigeria and Mexico and they are developing or illiberal democracies, um, the judiciary is starting to do things like um, rule things unconstitutional or starting to, to do some interesting things within those countries, but it's not yet like it's seen as basically sort of a co-equal part of government. Um, and in the UK, the parliamentary system and the concept of parliamentary sovereignty um, means that the House of Commons is sort of the predominant source of power within the country. So even in that country, the judiciary does not play a ma major role in sort of checking the political process or checking the, um, the power of the House of Commons itself. So we have a really set, a set of really weak judiciaries in this course. Um, which is an interesting, kind of an interesting, but also leads to us not talking about judiciaries as much as we talk about other things. Um, so there's a really important concept that I want to talk about. Uh, it is called rule of law, and it's sort of pretty well connected to to a healthy judici judiciary. Um, so it's essentially the term rule of law essentially describes a governance system in which um, the system operates relatively predictably under a a sort kind of a set of known um, and transparent rules essentially that the um that the, the rules of the game aren't changed in the middle of the game um that the rules are are enforced equally um and kind of throughout all the entire country evenly uh so we oftentimes describe in authoritarian regimes like like russia and china uh in contrast have something that we would call rule by law which uh, which essentially describes systems in which the the rulers of those countries kind of use the laws to wield power, um, and then that can the ways that can manifest is sort of political opponents brought up on corruption charges and um, and all sorts of of courts ruling things that are essentially um, arms of the the political powers within that those countries. Um, so rule of law is is generally seen as a, a really good thing and a kind of a need to have for a liberal, liberal democracy. Uh, so judiciary is very widely from country to country. So like we said, some, some countries, because of the structure of government, have a fairly weak judiciary, just as kind of parliamentary systems. Um, and then some, like the United States, have a very strong judiciary that uh, can rule laws and constitutional um, and, and things of that nature. So courts in authoritarian systems generally have little or no independence. So they are essentially controlled by the chief executive or by the powers that be within those countries. Um, and we would say do not have a lot of independence or a lot of autonomy to make decisions that are not the, the correct decisions. So thinking about the ways judiciaries are set up, um, oftentimes you can have constitutional courts uh, like the Supreme Court in the United States that would rule on the constitutionality of laws. So the UK did have a really, in, have, have sort of an interesting influx of this. So when it, 
kind of under the EU, you started to see a con you saw a constitutional or a Supreme Court set up within the UK that essentially ruled on laws that were in conflict with some some EU laws. Um, and now that they are essentially out of the EU, that's all a little bit in flux, uh, and and you wouldn't expect to see um, the court sort of ruling laws in kind of unconstitutional because they conflict with EU laws in the future. Um, but it's kind of a, well, we'll see what happens. Um, and then another concept is that's important is the concept of judicial review. Um, so that is the power of the ju judiciary to review laws and executive hours, ac sorry, executive actions for their constitutionality. So like we talked about with the United States, that's a, a really big, um, that's a really big thing that exists within the US system, right? Marbury, Mar Marbury versus Madison and all. Um, and that's that's in some ways kind of what I, what Americans see as uh, upholding the rule of law oftentimes there is kind of having this uh, having this branch in the government that just does this, right that that serves as a check on the other branches through this. Um, and what's really interesting, I think, is that we don't see a whole lot of this in these countries that we study. Um, so th in the UK, basically they have the what's called parliamentary sovereignty, which means that um, anything that comes out of the House of Commons is almost inherently constitutional um, by virtue of the fact that the House of Commons um, did it, right? So it's sort of a, a growing constitution that, that um, adapts or involves or, or sort of grows to include laws that are passed by the House of Commons. So we will talk a lot about that when we get to it. All right, so we're kind of moving on to all the other stuff in the government. Um, and in some countries, these sort of will play as really important in some countries, and then we'll barely talk about it in other countries. So one, one term you'll hear a lot is the term bureaucracy. So these are oftentimes agencies that implement government policy. So again, if you think about the US organizational chart, um, a lot of that was in the executive branch for our government, right? We have the president. The president chooses um, his or her cabinet, essentially um, the leader of 14 different departments of the federal government. Um, they, they have an apparatus or that's fairly hierarchical underneath them um, that implements the policy of the executive branch within those departments. And then we have all sorts of other kind of departments and things that flow from downward from that, um, and even even a few things that are off, off to the side. Uh, so in democracies, you have um, continuity. You have some sort. You have kind of the discretionary power of the people that are in charge at the time. So you have some kind of politicians that sweep in, but you also have a lot of people, kind of career people that work there, and and whose career it is to work under different administrations of different political parties. Um, and not be, you know, purged and stuff for <laughs> having the wrong ideas and and kind of things like that. Um, so in authoritarian regimes, uh, it's a little bit less less so. Um, they still obviously because they need people to carry out the government and you know do some things that are typical of government, even in authoritarian regimes. Um, but you are much likely to see kind of a a less organized. Um, and more based on political patronage or based on ideological compliance than um, in a developed democracy. All right, so just thinking about bureaucracy itself, um, oftentimes these are non-elected positions, or these, these generally speaking are non-elected positions. So in the United States, the top of these are selected by the president. In the UK, they put together sort of a Avengers-style team of people that are like the, the government the prime minister, but then all of his or her sort of pals that have a different um, different job within the legislature that they're in charge of, uh, they are. And below them is the bureau kind of the bureaucracy. Uh, so other characteristics, um, these are not sort of kind of the glamour work of government, oftentimes. Um, kind of serv civil service jobs, right? So oftentimes, like we said before, these are organized hierarchically kind of in a top-down way, uh, and in some cases are associated with red tape and inefficiency. All right, so the last thing I just want to talk about, and I just want to give a brief shout out to some of these other things um, that we will be talking about. So other important institutions that exist within the country and that we'll be looking at is the way that the government interacts with the media within the country. So all, every country has a media. Um, even authoritarian regimes oftentimes is 
not a free media that's able to operate the way that it would within uh, a developed democracy, but they have medias and medias are really, really important in authoritarian regimes. Um, so it's in interesting to look at the way in which the media uh, interacts within these countries. Um, in a few countries, the military is fairly important and, and is a source of political power. Uh, Nigeria is still a little bit. Um, and then Iran and China have actually done some interesting things that we'll talk about to limit the power of the military. So um, we will talk about some of those. Uh, Iran's got a weird and wacky array of different government bodies that are not not able to easily place within the executive or legislative branch. So we'll talk about some of those those fun fun structures. Uh, and then another one that's really, really important that we will talk a ton about in each country. Uh, so in some countries, parties are really, really, really important. Um, and in other countries, they're just kind of important. Um, so political parties are oftentimes a really important way in which which sort of politics happens within these countries, and within just about every country. Um, so we'll look at the role of political parties in countries like the UK, which are liberal open democracies where um, you have more sort of pluralis pluralistic competition between parties. And you'll also look at the way the party structure kind of within China, the one party structure reinforces authoritarianism within the country. So political parties are going to be very important. I would say of all of these, probably we'll spend the most of the time talking about political parties. And then the last thing just to mention are supranational organizations, which are um, kind of international, um, internationally organized um, kind of agreements or, or organizations that countries enter um, in which they relinquish some form of, of autonomy um, in some ways and co-op kind of to cooperate with other countries for economic, military, or political reasons. So um, this was a bigger part of the course before the UK left the EU, which they did last year. So now it sort of leaves us a little bit in no man's land <laughs> when talking about the EU, because it's still kind of in the course description a little bit, but the UK is not a part of it anymore. So we kind of don't know what to do with it. All right, cool.